Hey everybody, it is Quicken and welcome to my channel. It has not been my day at all, so let's hope that this video works out. It's not completely discolored, there's not lipstick on my teeth, there's not boogers in my nose, there's not pit stains. Fuck. <laughs> Hey everybody, crybaby aside, today I'm going to be talking about The King of Staten Island, the new Pete Davidson movie that came out last Friday. That was only four days ago, so let's hope that it's not completely irrelevant by now. News is going so fast. I don't even know if you guys will watch the movie after this review. It's like already gone, right? So as you may know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic and here in Pennsylvania, in my state, our movie theaters are not open yet and I don't know when they'll be open, but if you wanted to watch this movie, the only way you could watch it is VOD, video on demand by renting it from Amazon Prime or like, I think you could rent it from YouTube, I think, something like that. Last Friday, I rented the new Pete Davidson movie and today I'm going to talk about it. I took notes on the movie because you can only rent it for 24 hours and I had no idea until I purchased the movie that it was a movie that has a lot of storytelling through tattoos. So I'm going to give my review and I want to talk about the use of tattoos in storytelling in The King of Staten Island. So last weekend, Friday, a few days ago, I've established that. I knew this movie was coming out, but I was actually going to skip it. And the reason why is because I actually don't really consider Pete Davidson a really strong actor. And he's been on my radar for a while being a like heavily tattooed man in the entertainment industry. And even last year, I made a video called Celebrities with Surprisingly Good Tattoos because I think we hear a lot about celebrities with bad tattoos, so I wanted to make a video about celebrities with good tattoos. Looking at you, Macklemore. Came up the good work. Still very surprising. So when I was doing that research, I wanted to include Pete Davison in that video because he's on Saturday Night Live and people consume him as like a tattooed body all the time. But one, I really didn't think he belonged in the video because I didn't think his tattoos were very good. And then I beat myself up about it because like three weeks later, he announced that he was dating Ariana Grande and I was like, damn it, maybe someone would have clicked on my video. Um, but they didn't. So Pete, you know, has been on my radar for a little while. And I think a lot of us had our sexual renaissance when this photo came out. However, I do think that he is underutilized and maybe typecasted too much. He has one character on the show that is like so dumb and the idea of the character is that he's dumb and there's just something so lazy about the writing of that character that even though it might not be Pete's fault at all, it just makes me not like him. Also, he, you know, I stand Ariana. I didn't think that I would actually want to see this movie and I continue to be surprised by this movie because it is completely unexpected in every way. Even the trailers, I thought this was going to be an indie movie. And throughout my review, I think it would have been stronger as an indie movie, but it is a comedy. <laughs> I didn't know that. I saw a trailer where he's like walking a girl, I thought across train tracks, like walking a girl on a sidewalk and it's like the unexpected relationship between two characters and I was like, oh my God, does this tattooed eight foot nine freak befriend this little girl and discover himself? Like I had no idea what the movie was gonna even be about. But you know, the trailer for Invisible Man spoiled the whole movie. So, you know, what do I want? Do I wanna be completely surprised? I guess so. So The King of Staten Island is a movie that also closely follows Pete Davidson's real life. If you've watched any of his stand-up, and I have not watched his latest stand-up special, so I might regret making this video entirely. <laughs> That's pretty good. But if you've watched any of his stand-up, his father was a firefighter who died in 9-11, and that is something that follows Pete through this movie. But the movie isn't necessarily autobiographical and there are aspects of this movie that 
do not follow Pete's life at all, but it seems like this tragic event in Pete's life, he was able to lend to the storytelling of this movie, which I think is fair grounds. Though the movie is about failure to launch and failure to launch as a genre is like, oh, I still live at home with my parents and I haven't figured out my career yet. And in this movie, Pete being 24 and living with his mom is the biggest folly of his character. However, I mean, I lived with my boyfriend's parents until I was like 26. So I'm watching it like, he's fine. <laughs> he's gonna be fine. Are you fucking kidding me? Oh my God. God, I'm not refilming this. This is a low budget production. He's got his own room. Although he doesn't have a job. And that is because he is exploring becoming a tattoo artist, which I did not see in the trailers at all. I actually, for the first time, saw it in the description of the movie when I was looking it up to rent. I do want to say that this video may contain spoilers. So I, if you decide you're not gonna see the movie or you're gonna wait until it comes out on DVD or whatever, the movie doesn't have any like gotcha moments, so I'm not really spoiling like a thing, but I will be talking about the movie in depth, so if you want to wait to watch this review until later, this review might also convince you to watch it, so there's that as well. So talking more about Pete Davidson, the man, I have always thought that it was pretty interesting that he is a heavily tattooed entertainer. Although you mostly only see him on SNL, and on SNL, him being a tattooed person is usually a part of his character on the show. So I feel like he's not a character that is uplifted through being tattooed, but almost scrutinized by being tattooed. And you pick up on this in the movie as well. And it's interesting because the movie being kind of auto autobiographical, I actually got more of an insight into Pete because like I said, I feel like a lot of his tattoos aren't very good, but in the movie, he has this like emotional connection with another character and he expresses that he gets tattooed. Pete explains that his tattoos help him relax when Bill Burr's character asks him why he gets so many tattoos even though they hurt so much. So through that lens, you get to see some perspective of Pete Davidson's character, Scott, in The King of Staten Island. But I think it also shows you a little bit more about Pete too. If in the movie his father dies and in real life his father is dead, and in the movie it's him coping through being the son of a dead firefighter, I want to say that that moment in the movie, I think is authentic. And with that, I can't really beat Pete down about having so many crazy tattoos. Pete Davison himself is an actor who is very forthcoming about mental illness and having depression. So I think when you can get that insight into Pete Davison the man, that even though tattoos hurt, he gets them as a form of self-care, I think it's really interesting. And when you can lend that aspect into the storytelling of King of Staten Island, I think that it's, I think it's, it, I think it's pretty affirming, you know? I think it helps you get insight into people who are really like that, who do get a lot of tattoos, maybe all at once, or get tattoos from their friends, etc., etc. So the movie opens up with Pete and his friends, and he kind of has this like gang of like failure to launch friends who are all in Staten Island. And you get the feeling that they grew up in Staten Island and they're staying in Staten Island and it's good enough and that's it. The like, it's good enough is kind of something that carries throughout the whole movie. I've seen some criticisms of the movie that the entire arc of him and his like group of friends that hang out in a basement is like completely irrelevant to the story. But Pete wants to become a tattoo artist. So with that, he has like a tattoo machine that maybe he got off Amazon and he tattoos his friends. And I think the use of him tattooing his friends and his friends accepting these really terrible tattoos 
shows you a unique dynamic that I think is critical to the character of Pete Davidson, Scott. And that connection that his friends, who are also like failing to launch, allow Pete to tattoo them permanently with very amateur tattoos, shows that they are also in a similar position as Pete. However, throughout the story, his friends become less and less willing to allow Pete to tattoo them, and I think that decrease in willingness is also supposed to be the, the realization that, like, people are getting fed up with him and something has to change. So as the movie progresses, I do feel like tattoos continue to be a part of Pete's story. And one of the biggest critical parts of the movie, spoiler, is when Pete tattoos an underage kid. It's really weird watching that part of the movie because you as the audience member are like, no way. He knows better. He knows better. And I think it is a pretty good use of like shocking the audience senses of right and wrong because we all know that you shouldn't, one, really be tattooing your friends at a park outside. You know, that seems probably wrong and dangerous. So you're greeted with that, and then a kid walks by, and Pete's, Pete Davison's character, Scott, is like, do you want a tattoo? And the kid says yes, and from there, you as the audience member are like, okay, I thought this guy was, you know, failing to launch or whatever, but maybe he's just, like, really dumb? Or really self-destructive? Because after he tattoos the kid, he's really put face to face with something's gotta change here. Something's gotta change here, sir. Also, he calls it a tattoo gun. I think Pete, the man, knows better, but maybe this is to show the character Scott just wants to tattoo, but isn't putting in the effort to even learn about tattooing. So I think another use of tattoos through storytelling in The King of Staten Island is that the people in Scott's life all have pretty shitty tattoos from him, including his mom and I believe his sister. And these are all characters in the movie that want to support him, but are supporting him blindly. They're giving him all of their support in the movie and the girl he's seeing, I'm sorry. So all of the characters, including the girl he's seeing, his mom, his sister, all have these bad tattoos from him, but all give him this blind support. And I think that blind support is really well reflected in the fact that these characters get these bad tattoos from Scott, knowing they're bad, knowing he doesn't have the skill level to be very proficient at tattooing, and that tattoos are permanent almost, you know, on the same level as scars. But because they give Pete so much blind support, they're willing to take these tattoos from him. And the movie does a great job of showing you that they're bad. They're bad tattoos. His mom even shows her tattoo and someone goes, oh, is it a bunny? And she goes, no, it's my daughter. Even in that, you can see that the people close to him are willing to sacrifice even their idea of safety in order to support Pete. But you're not seeing the same support from him. He's not learning how to tattoo the right way and he's kind of putting all of his weight back on his family as they support him he's leaning into them with all of his weight back and not growing like they need him to and i think you know those shitty tattoos are a great analogy for that if you're a tattooed person in the audience viewing that you yourself go, oh yeah, that's a bad tattoo. That's really nice of them. So I think another way that tattoos are used in the storytelling of this movie is that any tattooed person, you're used to like uncomfortable conversations about your tattoos or just like polite exchanges that, you know, can feel a little routine or feel a little stale. Like, you know, personally, I was on the bus recently and this guy just started talking to me about my tattoos. And I have like a rhythm of things I generically say. And it was the same thing. He was like, I could never get a tattoo. And I was like, yeah, they're not for everybody, you know? So you 
also get this experience from Pete. You see first that Bill Burr's character, who is interested in dating his mom, has this small talk with him. And it's the same small talk you know as a tattooed person. So if you can put yourself in Scott Pete Davison's shoes, you know that this conversation is because Bill Burr's character doesn't know what else to talk about. He's trying to date his mom, which is already hard. So he's like, hey, you know, you got a lot of tattoos. Do you like sports? I think it's interesting how they can show that tension through a familiar conversation that we're used to having. But they also show Pete later at a party and this annoying girl is talking to him and it's a similar feeling that you can get. She's like, I want to get tattooed, but I, I really want to be an actor and I'm worried that if I get tattooed, I'll be offered less roles. And I thought that that was interesting because if you were to have that conversation, it's like unintentionally rude because the girl is basically saying, I would get tattoos, but it might ruin my life. And Pete, who is heavily tattooed, is standing there like, are you suggesting I ruin my life? And it's these little conversations that we have in our real life that we diffuse just to keep the status quo. So I thought it was interesting to see it in there. Because Pete uh, co-produced this movie, you can kind of feel that he wrote that line and he put it into the movie from his own experience. So I thought it was cool. Maybe being tattooed has completely limited his roles as an actor, but I personally love to see it. I'm happy to see him out there. So there is a part in the movie where Pete does approach a proper apprenticeship and he's actually met with Machine Gun Kelly, the person. And I didn't know that Machine Gun Kelly had a Clint Eastwood gorillas tattoo. Do I have to stand? So Machine Gun Kelly is portrayed in the movie as a tattoo artist. And Pete goes to his shop to talk about having an apprenticeship. And Machine Gun Kelly's character doesn't say anything out of the ordinary because we all know that apprenticeships are really, really, really hard. And they are kind of the, you know, that fence that keeps a lot of people out of tattooing. When Pete goes in and he's like, I wanna start an apprenticeship, Machine Gun Kelly goes, okay, well, it's gonna be really hard. I'm going to have you scrubbing tubes and cleaning my car. It's funny that he said cleaning my car because in Miami Inc, Ami James directly says that in his apprenticeship, he had to clean cars and take out the trash. So it was kind of interesting to hear that like word for word. So you as the viewer, you're like, okay, Pete has no choice. He's going to rise to the occasion. It's going to be hard work, but he's going to do it because he wants to be a tattoo artist. There's no other way. And Pete goes, no, nah, I'm not doing that. That's too much hard work. How much do I get paid? And Machine Gun Kelly, the tattoo artist, is like, nothing. Like, you're an apprentice. I think that this really shows how naive his character is. And it's unexpected because throughout the movie, you keep giving him, almost like his mom and his sister, you keep giving him the benefit of the doubt as a character. And it's pretty slick because you would think as heavily tattooed as the man is in the movie, why wouldn't he expect the apprenticeship to be difficult? How would he have no idea about what goes into an apprenticeship being so heavily tattooed? When Pete goes, nah, that's too hard. And then he starts a fight with the tattoo artist and he leaves, <laughs> which I like. You're kind of left with like, damn, does he have no idea? Like he wants to pursue this, but he really has no idea. And I think that is also reflected in the fact that throughout the movie, he wants to start, spoiler, a, uh, a tattoo restaurant. You see who like blindly agrees with him and who is critical of him throughout the whole movie with how they digest this really bad idea. His friends and his mom are blindly supportive of it. And then the guy pursuing his mom is like, that's the dumbest fucking idea I've ever heard of. Are you kidding me? And then when his mom starts to agree it's a bad idea, you know that she is like, you know, she's getting, she's over it. So I thought that that was cool. I have on here that at one point his love interest, um, 
they're naked together and the girl says that she missed his tattoos, like miss seeing them. I thought that was kind of special. And this might just be a compliment Pete has heard before in like his real life or whatever and inserted into the movie. Or it might be, you know, these characters in the movie who are blindly supporting him despite getting nothing in return from him, like absolutely zero. I thought that this was kind of a like, the character letting him back in a little bit. And then the character pushes him away completely, so I thought maybe that was like a little bit like, okay, come back in. Wait, no, you haven't changed at all. So the like redemption arc of this movie is powerfully cliche. I feel like if this movie was an indie movie, this would have went a lot smoother, but because it was this big commercial universal movie, I think they had to have the redemption arc with the cliche music and this part of the movie, like, you know, because you, you've seen it all before, you could have predicted it, but I do believe because this is a commercial movie, they had to have it. But in his redemption arc, I think it's kind of interesting that his tattoos switch and they become a point of interest about him and not something that is his failure. Instead of being like, you're like a terrible artist and you'll never become a tattoo artist, stop it. People then begin asking him about his tattoos and becoming interested in him. And it's not the like yucky, ask me about my tattoos because you don't know how to talk to me, but it's the, I'm genuinely interested in your journey. And some people, you know, show him their tattoos and that becomes a connection that he's able to make with other people. And you want to see strangers connecting with him because they don't have that tether that his mom and his sister have where they can't really be critical of him because they've always known him and they're familiar with his trauma. So they give him some allowances. But when these new people come in who just, Pete has to prove himself, it's interesting when they warm up to him and start talking to him about tattoos. And then a character in the movie says, you know what, you can tattoo me. Like, I believe in you. And that is the first like big opening. And I'm gonna say pretty big spoiler right now. So skip ahead. But if you have seen the movie, I think it's pretty unexpected that the tattoos are bad. <laughs> and I think that that's fun. I, I really like that. At the core, the movie is a comedy. And I think because it tackles really difficult subjects that we can relate to, when it reminds you that it's a comedy, it's like a little jarring and a little, little like a little cliche. You're like, oh yeah, I forgot this was a comedy, but I, I was, it was unexpected that, you know, he had not got better at his tattooing and that he was still bad. And one thing I think is kind of interesting is when Bill Burr's character does show the back tattoos to Pete Davidson's mom in the movie, she accepts them even though they're dirt. And I don't know if this means that Bill Burr's character has joined the love interest and the mom and the sister with like blindly believing in Pete because he blindly believes in his ability, although it hasn't gotten better, but he's willing to do it anyway. I'm not totally sure what that means because as I read it, I read it as, okay, well, Pete hasn't changed. What? However, you do see that Bill Burr is willing to like, what, get walked all over by Pete? That was something I couldn't compute. In an indie movie, I'd be like, oh, okay, it's like, it's like, oh, it's like worldly, like, oh. But in this movie, I was like, wait, what? So finally, I don't know if this is on purpose or not, but as Pete, you know, kind of peaks at the tippy top of the redemption part of, his, of this arc, when he goes to like make things right, you'll see that all the extras in the movie are all tattooed. And I don't know if this is on purpose, but I noticed it myself. And I don't know if this is the story saying that like Pete is now seeing the world as like a bigger picture or he's seeing more people that are like him. And he has this trauma in his life that has been really, really hard. And he's been really closed in about it. And now that more people are accepting him and opening up to him and understanding him, I don't know if the use of more tattooed people being brought into the background of the movie is supposed to show perspective or acceptance or 
Pete just hired a bunch of his buddies as extras. Like, I don't know, but that was kind of what I got from it. Maybe I'm digging too deep because this is a comedy, a commercial comedy. The final scene of the movie, he's sitting on the Staten Island ferry, which brings you out of Staten Island, which I think already shows you that he's willing to leave. And on the ferry, the people are visibly tattooed. So I thought that that was kind of cool. Maybe I'm thinking too much into it. I don't know, Pete, DM me. That was how I feel like tattoos were used in the storytelling of The King of Staten Island. I think the movie is worth watching. It's long and it costs $20 to rent, which might be kind of steep. If you get a couple friends over, which you can't, I do recommend this movie. I think that it has the potential to maybe be kind of a cult classic or like a coming of age because the comedy is dark comedy and it almost takes a back seat to the story. So like I said, I would have loved to have seen it you know, produced as an indie movie and go deeper into those thoughts. But Pete continues to be a comedian on like Saturday Night Live and stuff like that. But I think he has the potential to move forward out of that. I mean, he could be like a Jake Gyllenhaal or like a Johnny Depp, like a spooky cute. And I think that that would be his strength. Although he is a type, but the movie's really playful about his type. Like there's a part where he falls in the pool and he goes, I'm drowning. And Bill Burr's like, what? You're like eight foot. And I thought that was pretty funny because you know, he's kind of big and freaky. And like, we love it. So that is my review of The King of Staten Island. I think it's worth your watch with like a couple buds and a pizza. One of the biggest critiques of the movie is that it is over two hours long but I think that that gives it that like cult classic appeal that it is long and like a little dragging and it gives you perspective of him and his friends who all use slang and they use an iPhone and it's not some weird digitized like pear phone, no shade. So I think it's current and interesting and for me, no idea tattoos were used as an element of storytelling in the movie that I think gave me a unique perspective versus someone else watching it and live tweeting the whole time that it is too damn long. I thought it was a good length. Anyway, my name is Quicken. Please feel free to subscribe. And if you like me talking about tattoos, I have an entire tattoo talk playlist that you could give a check out here and you can subscribe here if you want to. Or follow me on Instagram where I post pictures of my face. Anyway, I love you guys so, so much. And if you didn't guess my look. <laughs> well, thank you. Gotcha. Okay, bye.